We talked about issues about needing not only to think about the issues of cybersecurity within your organisation, but how you educate customers like me um, to avoid doing stupid things um, that will allow um, those who want to take advantage of fools like me to do so, which in turn raised some questions for me about the psychology of people other than just pure criminals who somehow enjoy get a kick out of, um, say, unleashing malicious um, uh, malware. Why do people do that? And what kind of person does do that? We talked about issues about managing, managing risk, but how much of your time is spent actually reacting to risk versus being proactive in anticipating what risks might, inc uh, might, might occur. And um, we were also talking about the kinds of skill sets of people who um, might be employed in a cybersecurity function within an organisation. So we had plenty to talk about. I'm hoping that you will have a variety of questions, but I might, I might kick off, if I, if, I'm, if I may, myself, just reflecting on, 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 on Mike was just saying about no, no, no. So I might talk to you, ask you, Steve, to reflect on really an issue that, that, that Mike was talking about, namely your point that you said that it's not a case of if cyber attacks occur, but when. So the question then would be, as, as an information technology and security professional, how do you try to ensure that the issue of cyber security as a persistent business risk is front of mind for all employees, including the C-suite and boards? So um, first of all, sounds like um, I should have sat somewhere else for lunch, <laughs> but um, it was a great conversation. Um, so, so absolutely, and we talk about culture, right? And, and that really is both internal but also external, it's from uh, the boardroom to the mailroom, as we would say. Um, you know, I've said previously that um, cyber has gone mainstream, it is a topic of interest. Mike spoke about it also being a, a business risk, and I think there is greater recognition of that, which certainly helps the conversations that I need to have within ANZ um, happen. Effectively, I'm pushing on open doors, which is fantastic. All right. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to articulate it in business words, again to Mike's comments previously. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to have uh, an executive uh, committee as well as a board that are A, interested, um, quite well educated, uh, and I hope have confidence in management in terms of how we're responding uh, to this threat. Um, but it's more than just the leadership, and, and we talk a lot about sort of, uh, I guess, setting the tone. Um, it is also the other 50,000 people uh, that we, um, we have working for ANZ. And, and that's where we sort of get into that, that culture aspect, right? Um, and so we will do all the things that you would expect. So we will do email broadcasts and internet updates and those types of things. And they work okay, but to really make this something sort of central to the way that we operate, we need to adjust our, our approach. So for example, I spoke about um, phishing we test our 50,000 staff periodically with fake phishing things, right? We call them phishing fire drills. Now, I'm probably less interested in the number of people that click on the link, because I know at least one, many, many more actually, will click on the link. I'm actually really interested in the number of people that report it. Because if someone reports it, our security operations center has a much greater chance of doing something about it, right? So that's the type of sort of behavior that we drive for, as an example. Thanks very much. Okay, who's going to open questions? Please. And perhaps if you could identify yourself briefly. Sorry. Hi, uh, you raised some really good point, about, uh, Mike, about know the value of your data. How do you um, engage with your executives to actually establish the value of it? Because I, I see that as being the biggest challenge, the biggest disconnect between security and the business? Is it actually for the business to understand what that value is? Yeah, certainly. Um, one way you do that, obviously, is we're running the five nose, we've run the five nose exercise through the business. That started with the group executives first, so those people who work for the CEO. So part of that exercise is sitting down with their leadership team and working through what they think is valuable and then having our guys and girls call out to them what we also think is valuable. And you reach agreement, then you complete the other five nos. The other thing you can do, obviously, is the world gives you many examples every day that you can engage with your executives on or the top team and actually say, this happened to TalkTalk, Talk, UK telecommunications company. Not to pick on them, but actually it allows you to have that conversation. Many examples every day. It's a great way of having that conversation because it makes them 
they can relate to it when they start to see my line of business. Okay, I get it now. So never let someone else's crisis go to waste. <laughs> Hi, Ian Brightwell from DH4. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with Mike earlier and I'm going to touch on a topic we discussed and just ask him to reflect a bit more on it. Um, one of the frightening things when you're actually involved as a CIO or a CSO, CISO uh, is trying to be confident that you know when you've been attacked. And Mike said that he had two indicators, which were primary indicators in that area. I wonder, Mike, if you could just reflect on how you've built that into your organisation. And secondly, can you give us a little bit of an insight into how well other organisations, in maybe your previous job, were doing it without going into names and faces, but, but just give us a <laughs> sense of what that landscape looks like. Certainly, so, and thank you for the question. Um, so the two, the detection is important, but I'll actually just segue a little bit to what Steve said. So you can invest significantly in technology that helps you detect problems, but actually one of the best detection mechanisms is the staff member who says, this looks strange or this just happened. So we include that in that metric, but the two metrics I have for my team are time to detect, time to respond. On the basis something will happen, so how quickly can you get it after they've got in or got onto a computer, and then how quickly can you respond, because that's how you manage the risk effectively. Um, again, you do that through technology or through the human element. F from former life, of course, I can't comment on um, too much around that, other than my thinking in that space comes from my former world. You can use computers and clever mathematics to actually help the human deal with the scale of the problem. Steve's picture of there is no perimeter and here is an example of what it might look like, is the environment in which most corporations in this room would actually face. You've got to have the visibility of activity around your most valuable data and most valuable assets and look at that activity and understand when you see anomalies, is that a good anomaly because things do change and things are noisy or is that a bad thing? I think I'll add to that. Just so, uh, and again, um, I think industry recognised would be that that time to detect is simply too long, right? So depending on the report you read and the emails you subscribe to, it's over 200 days typically, right? Which is a long time for something to have happened before you discover it, right? So hopefully that time will come down. Thank you. Um, Karen Kuman from IBM. Um, some really great comments made um, and really um, good to see that the reinforcement that this is an executive leadership decision um, and focus area. But what I wanted to ask the panel was about what often is the weakest link in the chain and that is an SME that might be um, either on their own, working with other SMEs and, and get, get attacked and are not taking the same approach that, that large corporates are. Um, the other thing, of course, is they can be the weak link in the chain into bigger corporates. And, you know, I, I know there's examples out there where, you know, small accounting firms have provided the, link, uh, the weak link into a, into a serious incident with a mining company, for example. Um, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how the government's uh, cybersecurity strategy, which has um, very much uh, got a component focused on SMEs, but how you see that... Um, improving and, and uh, driving that cultural change. Because if we are going to have um, the economic benefits of this, we do need to ensure that large and small companies are, have the same approach. I, I, I might start in, in the um, gist of collaboration. I'll start and you can finish, right? So, um, <laughs> so absolutely agree. So by SMEs, I assume you mean small to medium enterprises, not subject matter experts, which is what I thought the first thought. But um, so I absolutely agree, right? So uh, there is a very important segment. Um, they're kind of big enough to know they've got a problem, but not necessarily big enough to know how to fix it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, collaboration is key, right? So we, for example, have partnered up with um, the Stay Safe Online uh, initiative. They released a small business uh, security guide, I think about a year ago, and we sort of helped to co-sponsor that. So that's, that's one example where we might be able to work together um, to improve that. I think from an ANZ perspective as well, if I think about protecting ANZ, these do make up our own ecosystem, right? So we use SMEs, there might be customers, there might be suppliers. As you pointed out, they might have access to our network, right, deliberately. So therefore, we do think of them in terms of what are their controls like, what else do we need to do to help them protect themselves and in turn protect us. 
we, we know that the bad guys will go um, you know, through the path of least resistance, and um, that might be uh, through uh, organisations such as the SMEs. I would say, before I hand it to Mike, that certainly um, uh, very positive, uh, I think, signs from the government's uh, updated policy or strategy. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that we're taking a step in the right direction there. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, just to overlap a little bit with Steve, so from Telstra's perspective, we care about our ecosystem, not just Telstra, and we apply equal weight on the security attention that the smaller companies or even our big partners like IBM actually, the big ones we don't generally have to worry about, the smaller ones we do focus on. We will mandate certain requirements depending on what they're doing for us. And in some cases, they will actually help them because they are an important partner to our business. So we have to actually have to go and help them, and we will do that. In regards to the government strategy, I think it's great and it's right that they're focusing on the small to medium enterprise. You know, and, and don't quote me on this, but 85% of the economy is in the hands of that sector. That's where you need some help. Mm. There's a, the big end of the big part of town. We invest significantly in this. The help is needed elsewhere because you're absolutely right. Actually, a problem there can cause a problem for other people. Actually, there's one over there, and then we'll come back to you, sir. Thank you, Mike and Steve. Uh, my name's Paul. I am uh, actually work with you a little, Mike. Um, I'm at Telstra. Just wanted to get your thoughts on the future in the context of the divergent technology stack and services that are being used by everyone, particularly in the context of things like cloud and hosting, where the security profile uh, you know, of a particular entity is, as a matter of course, uh, you know, tied to that of the, the relevant vendor and what, if any, global standards can be applied to have a, an overarching security profile there. Yeah, certainly. Um, there is, and obviously Steve will um, have a perspective on this. Um, if it's different, that'll be great for the conversation. Um, I've not yet seen a great global standard that actually is applicable to everyone or that space. But there is great, um, I'm encouraged by the approaches you're seeing companies take. Um, in regards to if you mean a organisation is reliant on their cloud provider such as Amazon, uh, I think it's the same thing. You pay attention to how Amazon takes security and what they do about it. We have engagement, so we actually have providers like Amazon. We'll engage with them and we'll understand how they do it. I will personally meet with their CISO to understand, and it's literally a 10 minute conversation for me, and then I understand whether this company gets it or they don't. We pay attention to that. Um, cloud, it's funny, cloud gets talked about. Cloud is actually a good thing. Cloud can actually solve some of your legacy security problems. People are fearful of cloud because I don't know if you've noticed, some people have this strange view that if the data is here in Australia, it's safe compared to it being somewhere else in the cloud overseas. That's not necessarily the case because the internet doesn't work that way. The internet doesn't have an immigration border that says, stop, show me your passport. <laughs> um, people need to think carefully about it. But the big cloud providers are taking this security seriously. But you can't rest on your laurels. You need to check that out. And that's the important thing. That's us as Telstra or ANZ paying attention to our valuable data and making sure a trusted partner that is critical to our business and our customers actually does take reasonable steps to protect that. And equally important, if something's happening to that data, they can tell us so we can tell our customers. We require that of our big providers. That's consistent with our five nose approach. The only thing I'd add to that is just know what you're getting into, right? And I think that's really what you said. Mm. So each organisation may be different, or probably will be different. Some will be completely in the cloud, others won't be at all. Um, it depends on your environment, your risk appetite, uh, your knowledge uh, and expertise. Hi, I'm Brian Baxu from CSC. And uh, I'm just interested, uh, both Steve and uh, Mike, on your thoughts around you know, the ability to measure the success of your strategies and your initiatives, uh, you know, to, to safeguard uh, and, and around uh, cybersecurity. And, and I guess how often are you surprised uh, after you run things like fishing expeditions, uh, you know, with the results? Um, so, yeah, so look, um, a lot of it is, is what I would say soft benefits, right? Trust me, we're better. Um, which gets me so far, but look, increasingly we, we do measure hard benefits as well, right? So that might be um, 
fraud's you know, obviously moving in the right direction. It might be you know time to detect and respond. So those types of metrics, I think, are very important. Um, how often am I surprised? I'm surprised all the time, right? Um, but in, in different types of ways. So um, I'm not surprised that someone will click the link. We know that. I feel myself, and I know the drill is coming. I almost feel my hand clicking up as well. So someone's going to click it, but it, it's always um, sort of in the detail, right? So. Um, you know, types of groups of people. So, you know, are execs more uh, likely to click a link than a tech, for example? It's those types of types of things. Yeah. It's a, sorry, it's a great question, right? Because there's no easy measure, but it's one we need to keep asking ourselves. How do you measure success? Because spending money isn't it, and just being compliant isn't. So we do, and we ask ourselves this all the time, we do actually look at the number of incidents where we may have lost data. And as bad as that sounds, that's important because you can measure and expect that to drop if your strategies are having an impact. If it's going the other way, actually, the strategies aren't working, you need to rethink it. Um, as for surprise, constantly surprise, what I worry about the most is what I don't know. So as a regular discipline, we will step back, I'll step back in our thinking and go, let's have someone else come in and challenge our thinking because we might have it right for this part, but we've forgotten about that over there. You've got to continually check yourself. Thank you, Steve. And Mike, uh, that was uh, really quite uh, uh, reassuring for most of us here in the audience. But I wanted to ask a question of Steve. Uh, you talked about collaboration with SMEs and uh, other, well, my name is Jim Deminx, uh, with the uh, SME area, but I wondered to what extent the Bankers Association here in Australia pools its resources and acts jointly, and uh, if it does so, uh, uh, how is that manifested? And also, how important is uh, protection of uh, cyber hacking uh, treated here in Australia in terms of the expenditure, and how did, would that compare with uh, um, your counterparts overseas. So a couple of questions there. Look, so I won't be able to go into too much detail on the, the bankers side of things other than to reiterate my point that we obviously focus on the SME um, segment as, a, as an important segment and we do invest time and effort to, to I guess, up the, the understanding and protection of that segment. Um, I think the later part of your question was around the level of investment in Australia versus overseas, correct? Look, um, interesting question. So um, I, I would say that um, there is a keen level of interest in cyber security in Australia. I would say that um, cyber hasn't just gone mainstream here, indeed very much internationally. Um, I work for the Australian New Zealand Bank, so I spent a bit of time in New Zealand and again very similar types of conversations there. Um, I spent time in the region too and again I would say certainly within the Asian jurisdictions quite a focus on cyber. Again a lot of that is built around building their own um, financial centres as being the safest place to do business and there is a bit of competition there but I think on the whole there is um, I guess an increasing uh, of the average shall we say across those jurisdictions. And then of course you have the US and Europe and, and again very strong regulation there, uh, particularly around privacy for example in Europe and I think we're seeing um, commensurate uh, investment as a result, would be my view. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to ask at this stage Sonia Eland from CSC to propose the vote of thanks. <laughs> 